interrupt our programming. This is a national emergency. Important details will follow. The emergency alert system has been activated. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. Many rivers and the air in many cities remain badly polluted and our citizens suffer from breathing that air. We lived with conditions like these for many, many years, but much that we once accepted as inevitable, we now find absolutely intolerable. Each of us all across this great land has a stake in maintaining and improving environmental quality, clean air and clean water, the wise use of our land, the protection of wildlife and natural beauty, parks for all to enjoy. These are part of the birthright of every American. To guarantee that birthright, we must act, and act decisively. It is literally now or never. Our program will emphasize conservation. The amount of energy being wasted, which could be saved, is greater than the total energy that we are importing from foreign countries. We will also stress development of our rich coal reserves in an environmentally sound way. Now it seems to me that if we would concentrate on resolving the problems uh, of the automobile, the combustion engine, the, uh, the pollution factor, and we've gone a long way in that. Uh, I think of myself as an environmentalist. I, uh, uh, I don't want to see all this beauty around us uh, wiped out or destroyed. We all know that human activities are changing the atmosphere in unexpected and in unprecedented ways. I recommend that we adopt a BTU tax on the heat content of energy as the best way to provide us with revenue to lower the deficit because it also combats pollution, promotes energy efficiency, promotes the independence economically of this country, as well as helping to reduce the debt and it is environmentally responsible. It will help us in the future as well as in the present with the deficit. The United States is committed to strengthening our energy security and confronting global climate change. And the best way to meet these goals is for America to continue leading the way toward the development of cleaner and more energy efficient technology. We gotta leave this planet at least as good as the planet we inherited from our parents, but we've got We've got a bigger problem with climate change. We sent we sent a billion dollars to foreign nations, many of them hostile, and in the because of our addiction to oil, and in the bargain we're melting the polar ice caps, changing the weather patterns all around the globe. The science is clear that man-made emissions of air pollution and global warming gases are changing global warming our atmosphere. It's still an issue that the scientists are still debating, and you know it, and I know it. The debate on the causes of climate change are far from settled. Well, the climate's always changing. That's not the fundamental question. The fundamental question is whether man-made activity is, the, is what's contributing most to I think CO2 is a problem, and therefore I don't think it needs to be regulated. We all breathe CO2, uh, climate changes, but there's no uh, evidence at all that it's man-made CO2 that causes the climate to change. The idea of human-induced global climate change is one of the greatest hoaxes perpetrated out of the scientific community. It is a hoax. I'm only concerned about the incredible frenzy and hype for something that's a total myth. It's amazing to me how uh, upset so many people are. The existence of all these billions of people on Earth have all influenced the climate of Earth, but none of it is of significance, uh, and thank goodness, things are doing just fine. 
the question is the degree to which man influences the climate and whether actually we can we can this is anything we should worry about and, and whether we should be bombing the global economy into the dark ages to try and stop it. Sure, you know, the greatest hoax I think has been around in, in many, many years, if not hundreds of years, has been this uh, hoax on the environment and global warming. You notice they don't call it global warming no, anymore. No, 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 it's because it's, it's getting it's, cooler. It's weather control. Yeah, it's yeah. getting cooler. You can't so, call it global uh, warming anymore. So what we need, what the world needs, is more fossil fuels. The evidence we have is not just that fossil fuels aren't ruining our planet, they're making it much better. Climate-related deaths are going down. And so what we need is many, many more fossil fuels so that people can eat and they can have food. Years of high school Aquanet hairspray use have done more damage to the ozone than any global warming scam has. Aqu I remember Aquanet. Aquanet. <laughs> every, every, I remember every, Bill, Brill Creek, we don't but I don't think that had one. anything to do with the climate. A little dabble, do you? That's remember right. that? <laughs> There's more. The CO2 can also go boo, boo, boo. At, CO, at times when CO2 was rich in the atmosphere, uh, there was greater growth of f farms, vineyards, and so forth. I, I guess in England, it, there was a time in which the growth of, of vineyards was so great, there was just wine all over the place. And But I'm still open to the possibility, so if there's anyone from ExxonMobil here, I've got a bank account and routing number available for you. One could argue from an economic point of view, we should be burning fossil fuels like gangbusters to generate as much wealth as we can, divert some of that into alternative energy research, and we might get to those alternative energies faster than if we starve poor people and ruin the world's economies and reduce CO2 emissions. Now, as we agreed, you owe me two, be two beers. <laughs> Scientific American editorialized on the escalating ugliness of climate denier tactics and rhetoric. The editors wondered if we are a people increasingly estranged from critical thinking, divorced from logic, alienated from objective truth.
big headline from climate scientists tonight. The U.N. International Panel on Climate Change says we are hurtling toward the day when climate change could be irreversible with catastrophic consequences, they say. It's only going to get worse if we don't take drastic measures. We've seen an increasing number of regions over the decades starting to lose ice, but this is the first time we've seen it almost globally. Most ominously, the report says we are in real danger of exceeding our carbon limit of one trillion tons. Scientists say that would warm the Earth more than three and a half degrees Fahrenheit making the impacts of climate change much more dangerous. And that's the worry. Many of the world's cities are in the crosshairs. Most of the people around the world live in coastal areas. It's where most of your major cities are because that's where ports are. And they are at sea level. So even small changes in sea level rise can displace millions of people. Scientists fly over a giant chunk of Antarctic ice as it cracks and collapses. The chunk is enormous, about seven times the size of Manhattan, 160 square miles. It was part of the Wilkins Ice Shelf, the biggest on Antarctica yet, scientists say, to fall victim to global warming. Watching Wilkins Ice Shelf disappear at the moment, we learn a lot more about how ice responds to climate change. The ice is just a small fraction of the Antarctic ice sheet, but it broke off well before scientists predicted, a sign they say that climate change might be happening faster than expected. One expert told us last year... But I think what we, what we do know is that ice uh, um, is probably our best sensor of these large-scale changes taking place. And in many ways, I think we're in under, uncharted territory. Ice plays a vital role in cooling the Earth's temperature and regulating sea levels. As it's lost, the planet gets warmer, sea levels rise, and more ice is threatened, a vicious environmental circle. Our glaciologists now who are getting very worried, but they haven't really come out and said what they think. Take a good look at it, because it won't be there for long. It's cracking and it's breaking up, and it's only one of dozens of Antarctic ice shelves collapsing faster than anyone predicted. I would say the vast majority of what we were looking at back there is broken up this year. It was a cool summer, right? Chicago, New York, places like that, so how can it be global warming? This is how. Look at the context. These blue dots over North America represent below average temperatures for the summer, June, July, August, what we call climatological summer. But look at the context. They're lost in a sea of red dots across much of the rest of the globe, just a couple other blue dots here and there. Those red dots are above average temperatures. What that translates to in terms of a ranking for this summer and for August, globally, second warmest on record, period of record going back a little more than a century. June through August, globally, the third warmest on record. The oceans, which had cooled for a couple years, now recovered with a vengeance. August, the warmest on record. June through August, also the warmest on record. Now, if the scientists are anywhere near correct, then this is the greatest challenge facing humanity today. It is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced and probably will ever face. If someone asked me if the climate system were changing, I would say, look at the data. The Arctic is, is experiencing, uh, I would say, a crisis. The meltdown is changing long held beliefs about the Arctic and its weather patterns, as well as being blamed for affecting conditions around the globe and triggering a rise in global sea levels. From all these collective studies of the whole Arctic region, you can see that it's warming much faster than the rest of the, of the planet. In 2012, we had a new record set in terms of melting over the Greenland ice sheet. But here, amid this snow and ice, it's hard to believe that the ice sheet is melting as fast as scientists say. But it is. Scientists say we are watching the polar regions melt right before our eyes. So you can tell there's a stream here, and then there's a bunch of flow coming down on this right side. Interpreting the info that comes from satellites called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. In science circles, it's called GRACE. GRACE can detect the most subtle, minute changes in land ice, down to the width of a human hair.
the faster speeds that we're seeing uh, in Greenland are not going to slow down. That's not the way uh, ice sheets behave. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. miraculous, horrible, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. It took a hundred years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. First of all, we're going to look at the runaway behavior that is actually happening to the Arctic system, going almost exponential. We saw the rate of change of ice area accelerating. We saw the change in ice mass or thickness also accelerating and moving towards zero over the next two or three years. And taken all together, we have the unmistakable footprint of a system in what we call self-amplification or runaway behavior. Uh, you may remember that in 2007 there was a, a big study that came out from this group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they looked at computer models of how rapidly Arctic ice would go away. And as of early 2007, this is what they were telling us, that um, we would see gradual drop in Arctic uh, ice minimum going down to where we probably still have a fair amount of ice left in the year 2100. Worst case, maybe by 2070 we would see open water in, uh, in the Arctic in the summertime. Uh, that very same year, uh, we saw in the actual observations a huge drop in the Arctic ice and that drop has continued so that in 2012 this is now where we are. So we're something like 50 years ahead of the worst case scenarios that scientists were giving us just five or six years ago with Arctic ice. I, I'm actually in agreement with many climate change deniers in that the IPCC is wrong. But I think they're actually wrong because they're too conservative. And they haven't really been telling the story of what really could happen. Can you summarize the effect of an ice-free Arctic on the world? Yes, the effect of an ice-free Arctic on the world is, is a very large one because it goes way beyond the Arctic itself. Because once the sea ice has disappeared, firstly, 
uh, that produces a, a decrease in the global albedo, the amount of radiation reflected uh, by the Earth, and has a knock-on effect in the sense that the warmer air masses in the Arctic in summer cause a retreat of the snow line, and the snow line decrease has just as big an effect on the albedo as the sea ice decrease has. So there's global albedo change, which affects the temperature of the entire planet, it warms it all up. Uh, and then there's the fact that as the sea ice retreats, it uh, allows the, the water masses around the shelves of the Arctic to warm up, and that warms up the seabed and releases more methane from the uh, subsea permafrost, which is melting away. And that methane itself is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. So we're having a methane kick uh, coming in from the retreat of the sea ice, which again is a global effect rather than simply an Arctic effect. I mean, the IPCC is uh, uh, there's a, it's not a whole load of people agreeing, it's a load of people saying, oh, it's this, it's this, it's this. And it's just that nearly everybody thinks that we are warming the planet. They disagree about how fast it'll happen. They disagree about whether negative or positive feedbacks are going to be more important. It's one of the more conservative scientific bodies on the planet. They work by consensus. And after the scientists reach consensus, they then vet their report through the political process. So politicians have to sign off on the IPCC's assessment before it's released, and they conclude that, that we've reached runaway in the absence of geoengineering. 2007 alone, in one year, it melted more than the previous year by an area equal to three times the size of California. And it will be all gone in five or ten years. And this is not in the model. The models don't show this happening. This is happening. So what happens when we update the models so that it does reflect that, that the Arctic is melting? So we're seeing effects. And one of the primary effects that uh, grabs most people's attention is what's happening with the Arctic sea ice, the ice that's floating on the Arctic Ocean. It covers usually most of the Arctic Ocean. Last year, 2012, was the record low, it was the lowest uh, Arctic summer ice that we have seen ever since we've been observing it. Whereas the rest of the globe has cooled since 1997, temperature in the Arctic has started to increase and increase increasingly rapidly. The hotter it gets, the faster it gets hotter. These are maps of the Earth's surface temperature anomalies, or variants from normal, over the last few decades. Everywhere you see yellow, orange, and red is where the temperature is now averaging above normal. Look at where most of the global warmth is occurring. It's pretty clear from the, the death spiral, that's the way in which the, the volumes of ice in the summer are zeroing in towards, uh, towards zero, that um, the ice can't last more than a couple more years. There's no way that ice mass at the end of September can continue going round this circle for the next five decades. It's moving very rapidly into the zero point in the centre. It's been decreasing for several decades, in fact way back into the 1960s and 70s. We, we have a trend pattern of decreasing area of sea ice particularly at its minimum, and minimum sea ice occurs in September, at the end of the summer warming. But do have a look at the last few years, from 2007 onwards, the data points have been pulling way down below the straight line. And it becomes more and more obvious that straight line representations are no longer the appropriate statistical tool for demonstrating what is going on in the Arctic then we see it looks like the end of the Arctic sea ice area in September by about 2015. So we're seeing a temperature rise. This is the NASA temperature graph of uh, going back to 1880 when we feel we have good global coverage with instruments. We can take it back much further. In fact, a very significant paper came out just this past spring which looked at a number of different uh, 
temperature proxies, as we call them, like tree rings and corals and uh, stalactites and caves and things like that. And we push back the temperature record 11,000 years. And what you've got is this, uh, you've got us coming out of the ice age back here, and then we've got a slow, 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 gradual, gradual decline until the last century. And then this is us here. So uh, we're, we're, we're pretty clear that, that uh, uh, something's changed in the last uh, 200 years, and the only thing that we've been able to track down that really uh, answers it is the, the uh, greenhouse gases that human beings have been putting out. What's going on in the Arctic area at the moment is probably the fastest moving response to global warming and climate change anywhere on the planet. Uh, one degree is bad. Two degrees is very bad. Three degrees is biblical. The Amazon turns to desert. Four degrees is sort of, is, well, we, actually we've got a, four degrees is, is beyond that. Five degrees is, is anyone else here? And six degrees is silence. The human trigger is now almost irrelevant. The feedbacks have taken over. In 1859, the English physicist John Tyndall, using equipment of his own design, showed that certain gases in the atmosphere blocked and absorbed long-wave or heat radiation. Four decades later, Svantar Henius, with thousands of manual calculations, made an estimate of the global warming power of CO2 that was very close to today's best models. In the 1950s, American Charles Keeling began to measure accurately the steady increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Spectrographic analysis soon showed that the new carbon was, without a doubt, man-made. So it's a rare gas. The atmosphere is almost all nitrogen and oxygen. But you see here that out of a million molecules of air in 1958, about 314 of them would be carbon dioxide molecules. And you see uh, the, the graph there at the lower left uh, tracing the first few years. So you can see a lot of things on this graph just right away. First of all, it's increasing with time. And here's what the Keeling curve, which is the popular name for this, looks like today. And you can see that what was 314 then is now 395 or so, pushing 400 uh, today. That's a remarkable uh, story uh, right there, because that increase is something like 25%. Uh, Mankind is changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere in important ways. And the greenhouse effect had been understood for a long time. The fact that carbon dioxide and other molecules uh, trap infrared energy, they trap heat essentially, had been known to experimental physicists in the middle 1800s. John Tyndall in London put carbon dioxide in a tube and uh, measured how it could absorb infrared energy, which he, he could shine on it. And uh, the first attempts to, to understand the implications of this for climate date back uh, to the uh, 1890s. So in a sense, the science was there uh, connecting carbon dioxide amounts in the atmosphere to climate change until we had the measurement showing that the CO2 was actually increasing, and increasing much more quickly than had been foreseen in the 19th century. There were more people using more coal and oil and natural gas, and the uh, rapidity of the growth of CO2 was a surprise uh, to everyone. Uh, Popular Mechanics magazine wrote about this in 1953. The, the products of this research were showing us that uh, if we continue to add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, we're going to see a rise in temperature. This was uh, the work of Dr. Gilbert Plass, who, was, uh, who published a very significant paper on this. This had been uh, an issue that had been kind of kicked around for the previous uh, 100 years or so, but it was this research that really kind of, uh, really kind of nailed it insofar as, as making the science clear. And uh, yet it's taken us this long to really uh, even begin to get through to the public dialogue of how important this is. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is what matters to the climate. Climate just reacts to how many of what kinds of heat trapping gases are there. The more there are of an important gas like CO2, which is by far the most important man-made gas, uh, the warmer it gets. Now on this graph is 
temperature and carbon dioxide. And let's look at the black line first. That's carbon dioxide, 1880 on the left, the present on the right. And so we know that it was rising gradually before Keeling's measurements began, and that in the times be before the 1800s, uh, when human activities presumably had no strong effect on climate, it uh, was near a value of 280 in these same units of molecules per million molecules. So CO2 has been rising, but uh, in all the years before uh, the 1930s, you might say, every year was below that average, and in recent years, every year's been above it. Again, the natural variability is due to factors like El Nino and the occasional strong volcano, which temporarily cools the climate for a year or two. And uh, so these things here are some of the strongest El Ninos uh, on record. But that there's a warming now and that this is period is different from this period isn't any doubt at all. So the question that people typically ask is, how do we know this isn't just some kind of a normal cycle? Okay, it's getting warmer, but it's been warmer in the past, it's been colder in the past. Uh, how do we know that this is, this is different from the past? Well, we can measure what's coming into and out of the planet by satellite. And the satellites do a pretty good job of this. We know that the planet is in energy imbalance. Um, we know that that energy imbalance uh, uh, is completely consistent with the predictions that have been made about greenhouse gases. And we know that that's quite a big energy imbalance. Uh, it's not small. In fact, it's equal to about 400,000 uh, Hiroshima nuclear bombs exploding every day. That's about four or five every second or so. That's how much energy is being trapped primarily in the ocean because the ocean is the biggest heat sink by far. From uh, here you are in the early 1900s, till today. Blue is cooler than average and yellow and orange are warmer than average. And you can see here it's still uh, some blue areas and so on, but starting in the 1970s, uh, you start to see the yellow and orange colors predominating. And uh, by the time this uh, ends, uh, 2010 or so, you can see what the world looks like today uh, in this picture. There's warming everywhere. There's more warming over the continents than over the oceans. There's more warming in the north than in the south. And there's the strongest warming in the Arctic. This is a Mercator projection, so it exaggerates the area of the Arctic. But the warming is strongest in high northern latitudes. And that's because of a number of feedbacks that we think we understand, of which the most important is that when warming occurs in the far north, the ice and snow melt, as we've seen. And the ice and snow having melted revealed darker water and darker land that was under them, which reflect less sunlight and therefore absorb more sunlight. So the chain of events is carbon dioxide causes the warming, the warming melts snow and ice, the melted snow and ice make the surface darker, the darker surface absorbs more sunlight, and that adds to the warming. So natural sources are in balance between emission and absorption. The oceans are actually net absorbers, but human beings, it's one-way traffic. So it's only us that can be causing the increase. Everything else, even volcanoes, is balanced by uptake. So it's only us that can be causing the increase. The mirror that's at the top of the world is going to be gone. It won't be gone in the wintertime, but the sun's not shining on it in the wintertime. So matters in the summertime. So the amount of really brilliant white reflection of sunlight back out into space is decreasing year on year. One of the key effects that this has is that when all of these northern areas are covered with white reflective snow and ice, it uh, bounces most of the solar energy off, bounces it back off into space. But when we are seeing more and more open water, dark soil and dark surfaces, then the solar energy tends to get absorbed. So instead of reflecting 90% of all the energy, you're absorbing 90% of all the energy. So this is what scientists call a positive feedback. And they don't mean that it's good. Uh, it's not a positive thing for us because it's more like a vicious cycle. More heat equals less ice, and less ice equals more heat, and it just sort of continues on in a spiral, and that's what we're seeing in the Arctic, and that's why the Arctic is warming at about twice the rate of the rest of the planet. And that means that sun's energy is being absorbed into the tundra, the frozen areas of the, of the northern um, 
continental masses and into the open ocean where the ice was, so that the whole system is now accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. The hotter it gets, the faster it gets hotter. The faster it gets hotter, the more water vapor. The more water vapor, the faster it gets hotter. The faster it gets hotter, the less ice. The less ice, the less reflection. So the faster it gets hotter. You begin to get the idea? It has to be a downward curving, what we call exponential decay. And you project that line forward as is done in this particular uh, setting of, of the equations and understanding of Arctic ice, ice mass loss. Then, once again, it shows zero ice floating on the Arctic Ocean by the end of summer 2015, which confirms precisely my own work on the decay of Arctic ice area to the same date. Now, mind you, at the same time, the thickness of the ice has also been diminishing. The, the, the ice in the Arctic now is thinner than it used to be, thus more vulnerable to melting. And just to give you an example of what's happening just in this uh, past season, this is from March, uh, March and April of 2013, looking at this area above Alaska. Uh, you had a cyclone going on up in this area that was moving, causing some torque on this ice, and the ice just started to, to fracture and break up in a manner that was very, very unusual. I talked to scientists at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and they said, what you're seeing here is happening because this ice would have been uh, maybe 20 feet thick 30 years ago, now it's only three feet thick. And so it's getting pushed around and broken up and much of this did, in fact, refreeze, but it refroze in a manner that was much thinner, much more fragile, and it is now being uh, pushed around and deformed much more easily and melted much more quickly than it would have been 50 years ago. When people think about climate change, they think in 2100. 2100, um, we might have two feet of more sea level. Gee, well, I can kind of deal with that. We're talking about 2010, 2020, it's going to be really serious impacts. If any of these things happen, which could happen any time, it's like playing Russian roulette with kind of a few bullets in the chamber. As the temperature starts to increase more quickly, then other feedbacks are also brought into play and more powerfully than they had been previously. The sixth consequence concerns what's happening to the Greenland ice cap. Now, it sits there as a one and a half mile thick layer of ice across a large piece of landmass. Once upon a time, 15,000 years ago, we had great ice sheets covering our most populous zones in the Western Hemisphere. Those ice sheets retreated very rapidly when the climate and the oceans switched. And what we're getting here now is a rate of retreat that I believe is unprecedented in terms of the last 10,000 years. Earlier this month, the surface of the ice sheet covering Greenland melted more widely than has been seen in 33 years of satellite imagery. We got some reports that there was melt going on all around Greenland, literally like so much water running off that it was washing out bridges and things, that there were runways that were on the snow that were having problems. You just had to be here uh, this time last year to watch this bridge completely wash out. The discharge of the river at that point was basically 200 times that of the Thames. Uh, the effect is small so far, but Greenland's mass loss has doubled over the last decade. And if that pattern of doubling uh, continues over coming decades, then we're going to have to rewrite some of the uh, predictions that we've made about how rapidly this is going to happen. The, the bed of the ice sheet in the interior ice sheet is frozen to its base and it's starting to slip. But this is the bedrock, mm -hmm. okay? And this is your ice and this is your water, so that we know. And then this water suddenly and violently drains through this 
channel, which is called Mullen, then suddenly you have a change into the direction, but it goes very fast. If we're focusing on this uh, little lake over here. You can see these meltwater lakes uh, popping up across the surface of the ice sheet as the uh, weather gets warmer and warmer. Uh, so what you'll see here is this meanders along, it meanders along until it goes down into the ice right there. And as it goes down, it's delivering all that heat down into the deep levels of the ice. So now the heat goes down here and just like a stick of the butter, the, the, the ice sheet begins to get soft. It begins to move faster and that water goes down to the bottom and because it's an incompressible fluid, it will support even a kilometer of ice. It will lubricate even a huge volume of ice and make it move faster over that rocky surface. So that accelerates uh, the process as well. The water across the surface of the ice sheet is rampant and it's causing untold damage to the base of the ice sheet. And it's doing that in deep interior regions that never before not least in the last 10,000 years, have been susceptible to that warming, that, that water input. That water draining down into the ice is relatively warm. The average temperature of the ice sheet at depth is several degrees below the freezing point, whereas the water that's draining in is right at the freezing point. So this is relatively warm water that drains in and it heats the ice sheet internally warmer ice deforms more easily than cold ice. So an increase in meltwater draining into the ice sheet has a softening effect, especially when the amount of meltwater is increasing. You know, Greenland is 23 feet of sea level, 7.3 meters, if it all melts. And the history is very clear. When it was warm, there's no ice on Greenland. When it's cold, there's lots of ice on Greenland. And so it's very clear Greenland is very tightly tied to temperature. And if it gets too hot, it goes away. And too hot is not very many degrees above where we are now. And this is the Alulasat Glacier. This is the calving front of Alulasat Glacier that we flew along on the first day. Uh, this is the fastest moving ice stream in the world. It's 400 feet high. The water is coming down under the ice and squirting out down here below the water line like a jacuzzi. And it's creating circulation down here and it's drawing warm ocean water in underneath the water line here to, and it makes it accelerate the calving off of the giant glaciers. And this whole bay here is just full of gigantic glaciers. As that movement accelerates, the ice upstream begins to crack and deform like this. And you can see as it cracks, that water begins to collect uh, in those cracks. And that water begins to absorb more heat. And because water is heavier than ice, it actually begins to hydrofracture its way down into the ice sheet, accelerating the movement even further. So what you're, what you're seeing is that at every stage, there is a, a different kind of a process that not only feeds on itself, but feeds into all the other processes in the cycle. Uh, in, in, on the ice sheet, if you want to know what, what's happening, you need to just follow the water and, and see what it's telling you. And this is the story that it's telling us. And this is why scientists uh, are starting to feel that Greenland uh, and, and, and uh, ice sheets across the planet have the capacity to move much faster uh, than what they have uh, in, during, uh, human, during human experience. So the, the big concern is that we don't tip ourselves into some kind of an event like that where the ice sheets begin to move at a pace that is really beyond human capacity to, to keep up with. As we move to acceleratingly increasing temperature change, as the waters all around Greenland are no longer covered with floating ice, and as the temperature of those waters around begins to increase, so, so of course the air over Greenland is hotter, the waters around it are hotter, 
the ice surface begins to melt right across the dome. Well, uh, last year in this place where, where we actually flew into um, Congar Lusiak, this is what the river look, looked like there. It was uh, overflowing, this bridge was washing out, giant machinery was being swept away because you were seeing melting that was happening over the entire surface of the ice sheet. Um, and uh, so they had never seen this kind of, uh, of water flow there in that river. So the consequences for the Greenland ice cap are massive. And as it melts, it adds fresh water to the global ocean and starts to raise the sea level. And if it goes quickly, then we can expect two, three, five, seven meters of sea level change right across the world to happen on a decadal basis, i.e. within 10 to 20 years. That would be catastrophic for civilization, many of whose urban centers would be below sea level in the new situation. Actually, the Greenland ice sheet is deglaciating, it's retreating, but its retreat is dynamic. It's drawing down the interior of the ice sheet faster than the models assume at present. And hence the ice sheet in its interior is accelerating and the melt at the margin is enhanced. And I think that means that this ice sheet is actively deglaciating. And that's a pretty serious problem for sea level rise. Let's move on now to the fourth consequence, and that is the impact on the tundra. Those land masses that border onto the Arctic Ocean now have a warmer, open sea coast. And the warmer air and the warmer temperatures are being fed back over the land mass. And of course, what that does is increase the rate of melting of the tundra permafrost, we get this depth of permafrost melt, or which we call the cast, increases year on year. That also has consequences. For instance, there's a lot of biological material in the deep freeze of the tundra, and as that thaws out, it begins to decay. The microbes have a, feed, a field day, and out comes more carbon dioxide and more methane from the rotting vegetation. So methane is being released into the atmosphere, not only from the ocean floor, but also, as I said, from the melting of the tundra. And the more methane there is in the atmosphere, as this next slide shows, the greater the greenhouse effect. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. When the permafrost thaws, the organic matter in the permafrost thaws as well and begins to decay. The microorganisms start to eat it. If there's no oxygen, the microorganisms make methane. If there's oxygen, the microorgan microorganisms make carbon dioxide. Ah, permafrost. Right here. Frozen dirt. We found, as far as the organic matter coming out of this hill slope, is that it's much more bioavailable, meaning it's, it's yummier for the microbes that are decomposing it than uh, carbon or organic matter near the surface today. So that has climate implications because that means that this organic matter is processed quicker. It's returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and methane and can feed back on climate that way. Sites like this where the permafrost is releasing organic matter act as, as accelerators. They speed up the process of human-caused climate change. So it's a, it's a large amplification of what we're doing. It feeds back onto our impacts. It's important to realize that the scale and rate of change that we're talking about now is several degrees, two to five degrees, in, in just a hundred years. So this is much faster than has happened in the last 50 million years. We're talking about unprecedented climate change and a very rapid, abrupt response from this ecosystem. There have been changes in the Arctic, in the permafrost, in terms of the temperature over time, not only in the shallow layers near the surface, but at 10, 20, and 50 meter depths, 
you're seeing changes that are even more rapid. That indicates that not only is there heating near the surface, but that this heat is being transported to depth very efficiently. Um, this is permafrost uh, stores methane, as Richard was talking about. It's currently melting. It's warmer up there. It's like five degrees warmer up in the Arctic than it is. The average temperature of the world is only up a degree, but up in the Arctic, it's up five degrees. And, and it's um, releasing 50 million tons per year, which is a, ton, a billion tons of CO2. And it's obviously rising. If it all went, we'd basically all be dead. I mean, and it's happening now. And the problem here is it's accelerating. Once it starts generating through this process or any of the other ones I talk about, once those processes generate more CO2 than we do, it won't matter if we stop completely. It's going to keep going. These are positive feedback loops. And by the way, it's not, it's not in the models. The fifth implication of the Arctic dynamics concerns the feedback of the methane release. It is probably one of the most important issues that we have to, have to examine. We will be in danger of destabilizing these things called methane hydrates, which store a lot of methane at the bottom of the ocean in a kind of frozen form. 10,000 billion tons of the stuff, and they are known to be destabilized by warming. This chunk of ice may look pretty unremarkable at first glance, but put a match to it and something amazing happens. As reported in this month's issue of The Atlantic, it's called methane hydrate, and it's actually not unusual at all. In fact, there are more than 100,000 trillion cubic feet of it on Earth. Volume-wise, that's like the size of the Mediterranean Sea. And it has a greater energy capacity than all the coal, oil, and natural gas on Earth combined. And while methane burns clean, unburned methane is a potent greenhouse gas, and if it leaks, it can be devastating to the environment. The USGS is confident leakage won't be a problem as long as proper precautions are taken. There are potential irreversible effects of melting the sea ice. If it begins to allow the Arctic Ocean to warm up and warm uh, the ocean floor, then we'll begin to release methane hydrate. About uh, eight years ago, we switched to studying the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. And actually, we've been studying it for the last eight years, continuously, year by year by year, conducting one or two expeditions a year. That hydrocarbons are produced within the sedimentary drape was sealed and uh, prevented the methane escape to the atmosphere. That is why we are telling that this should be the largest carbon hydrocarbon stock in the world over there. There is a potential risk that if warming continues, the larger, maybe a great and massive amount of methane could be released from this Iron Arctic shell. Of course, there is a potential risk. And in terms of potential risk, I, I would say that this Siberian Arctic shelf is the most potential because, as we said, the carbon pool is huge and the, the water shallow is very shallow and the warming occurs stronger than in different areas of the world ocean. And of course it is a potential risk. So the, the methane in the atmosphere the amount, the total amount of methane in the atmosphere, in the current atmosphere. It's about five gigatons. The amount of carbon of preserved um, in form of methane in this Arctic shelf is approximately from hundreds to thousands of gigatons. And of course, it's only 1% of that uh, amount is required to double the atmospheric burden of methane. But the, to destabilize 1% of this carbon pool, I think it's not much effort needed, considering that the state of permafrost and the amount of methane currently involved. Because the, what uh, divides this methane from the atmosphere is a very shallow water column and a weakening permafrost, which is losing its ability to seal, uh, to serve as a seal. And this is, I think it's a matter of 
It's not a matter of thousands of years, it's a matter of decades, I think. Maybe at most hundred years, but I think a matter of decades. It, it would happen anytime. It, it might potentially happen because um, just because this area is uh, very seismically and tectonically active. And there was some investigation that the tectonic activity is increasing. And the seismic activity is, what is seismic activity? It's destabilization of this grounds. It's just mechanical forcing destabilization. So it's additional pathways for this methane to be escaped. And many factors, I would lose, I would list you many factors that might, uh, that are very convenient and convincing for us, so that um, might happen. Not any time, I think, uh, any time sounds like it might happen today, it might happen tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Might. You think so? I'm no, but Igor is a very convinced person because he spent, uh, spent a lot of time over there and where the sea ice should be about two meters thick. It was 40 centimeters thick. That means that the processes, the, all the processes that serves, they serve destabilization of everything, of the sea ice, of the water column, of the, the currents increasing, the currents, I mean the movement of water beneath the sea ice increased. So everything Everything looks anomalous, even from our experience from these 10 years. Everything looks anomalous. And this is what made, makes him um, thinking that, ma making, um, making him think that the worst thing might happen. No, we cannot exclude this. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's less. Shortly speaking, we do not like what we see there. Absolutely do not like. Uh, look at this. In, in a matter of days, just days, we have this huge, this huge area. Look at this. Going, almost exploding with methane. The only way this is uh, possible is by melting melting of uh, methane clathrate it's, it's just the only explanation Hi, um, how long do you think we have before it becomes socially and otherwise unacceptable to emit ha. carbon? And I mean, how radically do you think we have to act consensually? Right, well, I mean, I think uh, it's you know, the, the more we act, the better things will be for future generations. I don't, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of estimates. And um, basically, if we do a huge amount within the next 10 years, we will still face quite an uncomfortable future. The less we do, the worse it will get. How much of it we can prevent depends on how bold we are, how much we're prepared to do, and that in turn is going to depend on changing social opinions. What are the implications of all this for global dynamic behavior, both in climate and indeed for humanity as a civilization and the biosphere of which we are a part. Well, obviously, the Arctic is connected to the rest of the world. It is part of the world. And what happens in the Arctic inevitably 
has implications and consequences and spin-off for the rest of the planet. Socially, we know we will be beginning to remove some of the aerosols, the particulates in the atmosphere that at the moment are reflecting much of the solar energy back into space. We also know that much energy is being taken up by heating of the deeper ocean at the moment. And as the effects of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases in the global behaviour as a whole begin to come back on stream, so global temperatures will begin to respond much as Arctic temperatures did. CO2 begins to increase temperature. Increased temperature drives water vapour feedback. Water vapour feedback accelerates heating. And then we begin to get hotter conditions for some of the tropical forests. We get burn and dieback and increased release of carbon dioxide from the biomass of the planet. It's a different set of feedbacks from that operating in the, in the, the high Arctic but it is nonetheless potent. And as in the Arctic, so tomorrow in the world as a whole. And if the implications of jet stream behavior and food production and Arctic dynamics spin off into our survival as a species, into our economics, into our food production, into the abandonment of the poor, and the inability to sustain a population of eight, nine, ten billion people. So also the increasing acceleration of global behavior which will inevitably follow unless we are able to intervene, to slow it down, bring it to a halt and reverse it, then Without that intervention, global dynamics hold a dark future for humanity, a dark future for the biosphere of which we are a part. It is time to take action, not only for the Arctic, but for the global crisis in which we are all placed. There's not agreement on how much we need to do how fast. Um, to be honest, I don't think there needs to be because the one thing I am certain of is that we will not do as much as the scientists say we need to do. Um, there, that's why I've never sort of looked that closely at that particular question because what the scientists say we need to do is over here, what we're currently doing is way over here and what various global agreements have tried to get us to do and often failed is somewhere over here. So the gulf is so enormous that, um, I, yeah, I mean, it's a perfectly fair question, but that, for that reason, I've never really looked at it in that much detail. But I do believe that the more people believe this, that the more likely they are to act. So I suspect that there's also, denial can operate on many levels. You can sort of believe something factually, but not believe it deep down in your heart. And so if you say, oh yes, I accept climate change, but, but you just won't allow yourself on an emotional level to think about what is going to happen to the planet in the future, then you can sort of separate your everyday life from what you believe in the more academic side of your mind. So, I think that uh, in many ways um, changing social opinion is the most important thing we can do at present to deal with this problem because then people might start moving towards what the scientists are saying we need to do. We've got a lot of work to do and not much time to do it. Um, as I look at the world, which is sort of where I start, um, <clears throat> we've got to cut carbon emissions fast then it becomes clear we need to cut carbon emissions 80 percent not by 2050 but by 2020. For decades now we environmentalists, environmentalists have been talking about the need to save the planet but as I think about it the planet's going to be around for a long time to come. What we need to save now is civilization itself. This is, this is what's at stake. 
coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda. I am fighting for my future. I am here to speak for all generations to come. I am here to speak speak on behalf of the starving children around the world whose cries go unheard. I am here to speak for the countless animals dying across this planet because they have nowhere left to go. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day, vanishing forever. All this is happening before our eyes and yet we act as if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. You don't know how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. If a child on the streets who has nothing is willing to share, why are we who have everything still so greedy? I am only a child, yet I know if all the money spent on war was spent on finding environmental answers, ending poverty, and finding treaties, what a wonderful place this earth would be. At school, even in kindergarten, you teach us how to behave in the world. You teach us to not to fight with others, to work things out, to respect others, to clean up our mess, not to hurt other creatures, to share, not be greedy. Then why do you go out and do the, uh, do the things you tell us not to do? You are deciding what kind of a world we are growing up in. Parents should be able to comfort their children by saying, everything's going to be all right. It's not the end of the world. And we're, and we're doing the best we can. But I don't think you can say that to us anymore. Are we even on your list of priorities? My dad always says, you are what you do, not what you say. Well, what you do makes me cry at night. You grown-ups say you love us, but I challenge you, please, make your actions reflect your words. Thank you.